This is Health and Society, a podcast series featuring early career researchers from the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London with interviewer Nigel Warburton. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk. Hello, I'm Nigel Warburton. Joining me today is Sam McLean, an ESRC-sponsored PhD candidate in the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at King's College London. Sam, we're going to focus on addiction and memory. That's a pair of terms that don't usually go together. Why addiction and memory? I think you're right to be slightly confused because for most of the 20th century, in fact, most of the time there has been a science of memory and addiction. They have not been linked together. In fact, in my own research, I have traced the link back to the first neuropathological models in the early 1880s. But it wasn't until about 1994, 1995, that neurobiologists and neuropsychologists of addiction and memory started to identify strong relationships and patterns between addiction and memory in the brain and the nervous system. Could you just explain what the connection between memory and addiction is? I can understand how you might connect pleasure, reinforcement of pleasure with addiction, but memory? Well, one of the the things that they noticed and were trying to explain these neurobiologists of addiction, they were trying to explain the extremely high rates of relapse. So a good example would be someone like Philip Seymour Hoffman, who was addicted, as we know from interviews that he'd done in the press, to cocaine and heroin in his early 20s, and then didn't touch an illegal substance for, he tells us, more than two decades. And yet in interviews up to only about a year before he died of a drug overdose, he said that the drugs were with him every day of his life. So in some sense, he was remembering the experience of being addicted. The reason the, the connection between addiction and memory is confusing, however, is because what neurobiologists of addiction mean by memory is not what we commonly refer to as memory. So for Philip Seymour Hoffman, he's actually remembering calling to mind his intense experiences with drugs, even though he's not taking them, and his tendency to be addicted to them. But for a neuroscientist talking about memory and addiction, there might not be that phenomenological aspect, there might not be the sort of sense of recalling things. It's more a pattern, is it? I wouldn't say that so much. I would say that they're interested in explaining a particular dimension of memory. So they're interested in trying to work out the neurobiological mechanisms that are involved, that are necessary for memory to exist. They're not interested in the phenomenological aspect of memory, i.e. how Philip Seymour Hoffman actually experiences or experienced addiction. So that would be the difference. So it's more like they're interested in the, the engine of the car rather than the experience of driving the car. I think that's a pretty good analogy. I mean... One of the reasons I find this area of research so fascinating is that it challenges our dependency on overly cognitive or overly rational conceptions of memory, which have dominated memory science since William James. So when we ordinarily talk about memory, we talk about something that we can consciously recall. So I will say I can remember when I was five years old and I was really obsessed with Bruce Lee. That would be a cognitive conscious memory. For the most part, when addiction neuroscientists are talking about drug memory or the relationship between addiction and memory, they are not talking about that kind of memory. They're talking about the capacity of the body to remember previous experience. That's really interesting. It's almost as if the body is remembering. The individual is not necessarily having any kind of conscious experience that plays back to them something that's happened to them. It's, it's more like a, a memory that a musician might have of playing a piece. They don't have to think about every finger movement. They just play that Chopin prelude. The last part of what you said is really interesting because, in fact, probably from about probably the 1960s, they started to localise particular types of memory and particular parts of the brain. So one of the really famous early memory studies are the Brenda Milner HM studies. 
And this is a guy who had much of the hippocampus in his brain removed because of epilepsy. It was a neurosurgical procedure to help this particular individual have a higher quality of life. And what they found was that only particular parts of his memory were damaged by the removal of these particular parts of the brain. So on a weekly basis, HM would go into these experiments and remember, this is, might have been on a weekly basis for years and he wouldn't ever remember the faces or the people he was coming into contact with. He could never remember doing the particular neuropsychological tests he was undertaking and yet he was improving. So what that tells us is that there are different types of memory. His conscious memory, his capacity, as I was saying, to recall past experiences was damaged. He couldn't remember the people. He couldn't remember having done the, the tests. But there was something about the motor action involved in doing the tests which was not impaired by the removal of this part of the brain. Now that's really important because the very early, I would say some of the really early addiction memory research was really focused on the cerebellum, which is a part of the brain at the base of the brain that's really important for motor action. Somehow, though they weren't quite sure how, addiction was impairing or damaging, leaving signs of impairment in the cerebellum, which was reflected in problems with motor action. That's a really interesting example of how brain damage affects learning, but how does that relate to addiction? That's a good question, and there are a number of different answers to that, depending on the groups of neuroscientists who are working on it. But there's one group of addiction neuroscientists in Stanford who are interested in exploring what they call drug memories. For the most part, when addiction neuroscientists are talking about the relationship between addiction and memory, they're talking about the relationship addiction and memory processes share in the nervous system and in the brain. This research seems to be suggesting, however, that addiction produces particular kinds of memories. That is what they call drug memories. And one of the addiction neuroscientists who I interviewed for my research described them thus. Drug memories are visceral, emotional, intense memories that are widely distributed throughout the brain and nervous system and maybe, might be, permanent once encoded in the brain and nervous system, which holds many important implications for the treatment of addiction, which has been so proven so difficult. Well, if they're permanent, that seems to imply there's nothing we can do. But presumably that's not true. Well, most of the addiction neuroscientists that I work with and talk to are guided by the aim of developing therapeutic treatments for addiction. Um, but here's a paradox in the science. So a lot of the addiction memory research, in fact, emerges out of research into PTSD, which started to resurface or emerge strongly at the turn of this century, where they showed that uh, a simple beta blocker, propranolol, could not take away what they call trauma memories or memories of a traumatic experience, but could weaken the physiological response to particular memories. So some groups of addiction neuroscientists were intrigued by the idea of this research and wanted to explore the extent to which that could work with drug memories. Now, some of the addiction neuroscientists think that it can be therapeutically useful, these kind of pharmacological agents like propranolol. But there are other groups of addiction neuroscientists who, like those who I was talking about, who are talking about drug memories, who are far more sceptical about the idea of being able to treat addiction in this way. Now, this is all fascinating, but I want you to step back now and say what you're doing in your research, because you're not a neuroscientist. You're not actually actively involved looking at people's brains in that way. You're, you're observing what people are saying about people's brains. Yeah, so my research really has two aims. Firstly, I'm interested in trying to explain how these addiction neuroscientists 
came to perceive addiction as a problem of memory. So that's a strongly historical aspect to my research. The second part is more philosophical, where I'm trying to explore or explain what the underlying ideas or conceptions of the human animal underpin this kind of research and these models of addiction. So one implication of this research seems to be this for me, which is for the most part when we talk about memory, when we think about memory, we think about memory in a positive way. That is to say, without memory, we could not do or be the kinds of people we are. We couldn't have a conversation like this. I couldn't walk. I couldn't do any of the things that I value in my life. And that's how we generally think about memory. But I think actually there's a deeper philosophical implication in this drug memory research, which returns us to a point that we find in Nietzsche and we find in Bergson, which is that memory is also a condition of suffering. It is precisely that we are creatures with this incredible capacity for remembering the past that we are able to suffer. And I believe that addiction neuroscience that's looking at this relationship between addiction and memory shows that to us. Sam McLean, thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to Health and Society. This podcast series is sponsored by the Educational Fund and produced by Aidan Judd and Ellie Clifford. For further information and more podcasts, go to www.healthandsociety.co.uk.